186. Humanism and Christ's Kingdom A special Calcedon Alert No. 2, Calcedon Report No. 201, May 1982 In January 1982, President Reagan introduced a bill into Congress to control ostensible racism in Christian schools and to control the churches of which these schools are a part. No more evidence of, quote, racism, end quote, was shown in two cases out of 538 investigations by the Internal Revenue Service. All the same, many thousands of institutions were to be radically controlled by the bill. By March 1982, the President's bill was apparently virtually dead, but not the impetus behind it. Some states saw the introduction of similar measures, as well as other bills to place all Christian schools under state departments of public instruction. In one major state, a bill was introduced to give the state sole and exclusive control over all instruction and all instructional programs. This state's Department of Public Instruction, in its analysis of the bill, stated the following. Instruction includes teaching, educational counselling, the rendering of advice on educational matters, or any other process by which knowledge is attempted to be imparted to any person by another. Instruction elsewhere than school means the instruction of any person of compulsory attendance age, which regularly occurs outside of a public school, and other than as authorised or provided under the auspices of a school district pursuant to statutes. Consider the implications of this measure. Any non-state-approved regular teaching of children ages 5 to 18 would be illegal unless licensed, regulated and controlled by the State Department of Education. This would include Sunday school, church services attended by those aged 5 to 18, nightly family Bible readings, teaching and prayer, Christian schools and more. At least one other state is trying to gain most of these powers by fiat regulation. At least one or more are planning to do the same, and courts in many states are asserting the same powers. The argument of many congressmen and senators who have defended the President's bill is 1. That tax exemption is not a privilege, but a subsidy. And 2. Activities contrary to public policy are not entitled to tax exemption. Both arguments are totalitarian and fascistic. The next logical step from these premises is to deny freedom to anyone who holds to opinions or is active in matters contrary to public policy, whether or not the activists are tax exempt. Religious freedom is not a grant from the state, but the affirmation of the sovereignty of God, not the state. We are not one nation under God if the state can control religion. From the days of the early church, Christians have fought for freedom from state controls because Jesus Christ is Lord or Sovereign, and Christ is Lord over Caesar, not Caesar over Christ. That victory is now in jeopardy. It is in jeopardy from two sources. First, from the assaults of humanistic statism, and, second, from churchmen whose voices always trumpet retreat and surrender. One prominent man is justifying surrender to state licensure on the grounds of Acts chapter 21, verse 40. Paul, after the mob scene in the temple, was taken into custody by the Roman captain. Paul asked for permission to speak to the crowd, identifying himself as a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. Acts chapter 21, verse 39. To be a citizen of Tarsus meant that one belonged to an old aristocracy with full burgess rights, which were respected in Rome. See W. K. Ramsey, The Cities of St. Paul, 1907, page 174, following. This fact would have made the captain ready to be agreeable. Paul, however, may have meant that he was a citizen of Rome, which he was, a point the captain missed, to his later dismay. See R. C. H. Lensky, The Interpretation of the Acts of the Apostles, 1944, pages 896, following. Then we are told the captain gave, quote, license, end quote, to speak, according to the King James Version. The word translated as license is the Greek epitrepo, to allow, let or permit. It has no reference to formal licensure, and a military captain had no such power to license. 
that a man of learning would offer such a, quote, justification, end quote, for licensure and surrender indicates in him and those who follow him an amazing intellectual prostitution and cowardice. These men refuse to comment on the many texts which tell us, as Acts chapter 5 verse 29 does, we ought to obey God rather than men. Meanwhile, one of the clearest indications of God's grace to the United States is that he is raising up an increasing number of men all over the country who will not surrender to Caesar. More than a few have paid or are paying a price for this. On February the 18th, 1982, in Nebraska, District Judge Raymond Case sentenced Pastor Everett Sullivan of the Faith Baptist Church, Louisville, Nebraska, to a four-month prison sentence on a contempt of court hearing. Pastor Sullivan had refused to allow the church's school ministry to be licensed and controlled by the state. What we are seeing all over the world is a rise of fascism. Fascism is a form of socialism which retains the forms of a republic and or a democracy while rendering those forms meaningless. Open socialism proceeds to the outright ownership, quote, free end quote elections and like things. Benito Mussolini, the first fascist leader, was a Marxist who learned his lesson well from Lenin and his associates. The Soviet Union, more openly socialistic, all the same adopted the forms it sought to destroy. It calls itself a union of Soviet socialist republics, although none are republics. It uses the appearance of elections to ratify totalitarianism. It has a legislative body with no independent voice. Unions which cannot strike, hold free meetings and elections, or do anything normal to a union, and so on and on. The Soviet Union has instituted history's perhaps greatest slave state. Red China is its rival here, in the name of freedom, and it presents itself to the world as a champion of freedom. Because all socialist states find it necessary to disguise their tyranny, they all become fascists in due time. A few Marxist journalists are belatedly waking up to this fact. Like most modern states the world over, the United States is moving into fascism. Its excuse is the civil rights of people, the desire to further brotherhood, prevent injustice and so on, the classic justifications for tyranny in every age. Limit freedom to gain worthy goals, say these apologists. One congressman has written, defending the president's bill, that the federal government must protect the civil rights of all Americans, regardless of race, colour or creed, and hence controls are necessary. Presidential aide Edwin Meese feels that the federal government has the power to require, if it chooses, the ordination of women as pastors and priests, no discrimination, and of homosexuals as well. He does not believe this administration will take that step. To assert the priority of the Civil Rights Act over the First Amendment means that discrimination in terms of creed can also be abolished. Churches and synagogues will then be required to give equal time to all faiths, to humanism, atheism, Buddhism, Mohammedanism, and so on. In at least one court decision, this is implicit. The new fascism, more than the old, seeks to justify itself in terms of every humanitarian idea, in terms of social justice, brotherhood, equality, and the like. In the process, it begins by destroying freedom and then all the goals it claims to seek. The major beneficiary, and the one continuing beneficiary of the new fascism, is the state, the modern power state. The champions of the new fascism in civil government, the press and media, the university, the pulpit, are a self-styled elite who believe that their program of controls is the solution for all man's problems. They love controls, as David Lebedoff points out in The New Elite, The Death of Democracy, 1981, because growth is free and uncontrolled. Risk, the entrepreneurial climate and necessity, is a horror to the new elite. They want a controlled world possible only in the graveyard. Because the new elite distrusts representative government, it looks increasingly to rule by court fiat, and, as a result, the courts are more and more ruling the country. On top of this, sweetheart suits are increasingly used to sidestep any defence by the people. In a, quote, sweetheart suit, end quote, one branch of the federal government, 
For example, the Justice Department sues another branch, for example, the Internal Revenue Service, as the ostensible champion of some aspect of the non-statist sector, for example, Christian schools. The real defendant is kept in ignorance of the trial until a decision is rendered. All this in the name of human rights? This is the new fascism, together with bureaucratic regulations. Huey Long, when asked if America would ever go fascist, said, Yes, only we'll call it anti-fascism. We call reaction reform. We call slavery freedom, and so on. As Lebedoff says, An elite is coming to power under the name of anti-elitism. Thus, every change in the rules was made in the name of reform. Quote, open this, end quote, was a battle cry of those who closed things up. What the new elite extols is precisely what it seeks to destroy. Page 82. Moreover, for the new fascism, here as in Sweden, Roland Huntford, the new totalitarians, 1971, justice is now equated with legality. The presupposition of such a view is that the state is God walking on earth, and therefore there is no truth nor justice beyond the state, or the, quote, great society, end quote. What the state does is just, because there is said to be no God whose doctrines can be used to judge the state and its laws. At the foundation of the new fascism is the denial of the God of Scripture and the assertion of the ultimacy of man, elite man or the philosopher kings, and man's humanistic state. Such a view abolishes by fiat any higher law, and it denies any court higher than man's court. The denial of any law, of God, and of any court above man in the state, is the foundation of tyranny. Status fiats are then both law and justice. The vital nerve of resistance to evil, the faith in a higher good, the God of Scripture, is then cut, and darkness settles over the land. Crime then ceases to be sin but becomes social deviation, a refusal to bow down to the modern bell, the state. Then too, the state, without God, ceases to be what St Paul tells us God ordains it to be, a terror to evildoers, Romans chapter 13 verses 3 and 4, and becomes instead a terror to the godly. The state asserts and equates its control with justice when Scripture tells us that it is God's law word which is alone justice. St. Augustine saw clearly in the city of God that a state without God and submission to him is simply a larger criminal gang or syndicate. The modern state is less and less a terror to evildoers and more and more a threat to the godly. In Sweden, according to Huntford, page 336, a state legal expert has said openly, our aim is to remove all traces of church morality from legislation. The same goal is in evidence in one country after another, and certainly in the United States. Emancipation and freedom have come to mean to humanistic statism, liberation from God and his word into the world of the tempter. Every man his own God, doing what he considers right in his own eyes. Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 This new liberation is ancient sin and tyranny. This decade will see this battle develop with force and intensity. There is no neutrality in this war, and Christ recognises none. There was a time when the most common painting, reference and designation of Jesus Christ was as Christ the King. The Puritan battle cry was, The crown rights of King Jesus. He is the Lord, the Sovereign, and we cannot surrender that which belongs to him without incurring his judgment. If you are indifferent to what is happening to Christ's faithful ones, what can you expect from Christ the Judge? We dare not surrender to anyone that which is the crown property of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords.